Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today's subject matter for Cascaders podcasts on principles is about a juicy topic that's part of public law. It's the principle that local authorities and ICBs must not make an error of law on the way to their decisions. And by that, we mean mess up the interpretation of the specific words or the duties in the relevant statutes. And there's lots of examples from around the country over the last three decades, and interestingly today, from the health field as well as social services. So what is an error of law? First and foremost, it's misunderstanding the meaning of the word uh, that is used in the statute or the regulations for whatever reason. In this country, the system is that the judges in our courts are the people who decide on the interpretation of statutes other than in exceptional circumstances. And that would be in judicial reviews in this field of law. An example is when um, a local authority interprets a word or a concept in a way that the rest of the sentence or the paragraph or the section simply can't be said to justify. Using a bit of law for a dodgy purpose as well can amount to an error of law. And by that, I mean using a law for a purpose that cannot have possibly been the one that Parliament had in mind. To give you an extreme example, selling off council houses in order to make people want to vote one way or the other. That was an example from many, many years ago. That's what's called gerrymandering. And you need to understand that if the purpose of a power is not spelt out in the statute, in words of one syllable, then the court will determine what, if any, the implied restrictions on the exercise of the power should be. So they'll take a very public policy approach as to what a statute is for. And then if it's still not clear, they will use something called principles of statutory interpretation, rules for whether it matters, for instance, where the comma is in a sentence, rules that refer to his meaning her and their these days. So rules that have been passed down through cases over the years. And those rules themselves have been the thing on which judgments turned over the years one way or the other. So to give you an example, in the social care sphere, we've got cases involving errors of law regarding something as fundamental as the relevance of the local authority's finances for the purposes of assessment, eligibility decision making and care planning tasks. That's the infamous Gloucestershire case from 1997 that kicked off the whole bandwagon of judicial review. We've got recent cases regarding the meaning of the scope of social care, the charging rules for Section 117 of the Mental Health Act, the meaning of the words ordinary residents in the Care Act and in Section 117, the scope of health service law for the issue of direct payments through the NHS, case law on the scope of the conditions that can be stuck on a direct payment, and the meaning of some of the words in the Mental Capacity Act. So whereas in other weeks we've been looking at rationality and fairness, now we're looking at error of law. And I'll give you an obvious example from the case law that we've already looked at and we know about. For instance, in the Care Act, there is the duty in Section 9 and in lots of the other sections as well, which require the council to involve, obviously, the client, sometimes the carer, and then a nominated person. So if the client can uh, express their wish that X, Y, or Z should be involved, then there is a duty to involve them. And that might be their existing advocate or a friend uh, in a social services decision, because I'm now talking about the CARE Act. If you take a similar provision in the Mental Capacity Act, which is of even wider import than the CARE Act, there's the wording, interested in his welfare. What does that mean? 
if that's the test of who should be consulted on a best interests decision, um, where does that then uh, come in? So section 4.7 of the mental capacity says this, he, the decision maker, must take into account if it is, first of all, practicable, and secondly, appropriate to consult the following people, the views of anyone named by the person as someone to be consulted on matters or matters of that kind, anyone engaged in caring for the person or interested in his welfare. So there you've got the concept of being engaged in caring for the person. And it's not clear whether that means informal carers or people who have been engaged as self-employed or who are otherwise being paid. But whatever that means, the words or interested in his welfare then appear. In the Croydon case that we've looked at before in this series, Croydon famously tried to say that this piece of law could not be meant to mean that a care provider could be consulted on a revision exercise because Croydon said the uh, provider was commercially conflicted. And uh, the local uh, authority was found to have made an error of law in that regard. I think I've got to take the word not out of that sentence to make it make sense. But my point is here that the judge thought that the words interested in a person's welfare was generally wide enough to incorporate the right of people who are earning a living. And to translate this into English for you, this means that if um, a best interest decision has got to be made, for instance, about whether somebody should be moved from one service to another, the current care provider, whether you like them or not, is definitely interested in the welfare of the individual and has a right to be consulted. It's not surprising when you think that they're likely to be the people who have had the most recent up-to-date experience of looking after the person. And this means that um, a person's parents could be regarded as appropriate to consult by the local authority, even if the service user's wishes and feelings were to the opposite effect. Because the context of this legislation is that we are talking about the wishes and feelings here of incapacitated people. Otherwise, we wouldn't be under the Mental Capacity Act. And so this is really important. And I'm hoping it's giving you a flavor that error of law is a good thing to be uh, trying to use in public law challenges. Now, to give you an example from direct payments law, I expect everybody knows that you're not supposed to pay close relatives who live in the same household out of the direct payment. First and foremost, I have to say that we've come across lots of councils who just say you can't employ your relatives and they just leave it at that. But that's not what the regulations say. In the regulations, there's a set of conditions that must apply to the making of all direct payments. And the condition in question is this. Direct payments must be made subject to the condition that they must not be used to pay any person mentioned in paragraph three. OK, so on the next page, I have got paragraph three. And the persons who appear in this paragraph who can't be paid are first and foremost the spouse or civil partner of the adult. And let's just think about that. We're talking here about your closest person. They'll generally be living in the same household as you, but it doesn't say that that bit of the rule about households applies to them. So it can't. It can't be said to be a caveat on the spouse or civil partner not being able to be paid. It's any spouse or civil partner wherever they are living, in my view. And this is the one I'd like you to think about here. A person who lives with the adult as if their spouse or civil partner. Now, I'm guessing that you're guessing that that's to stop cohabiting couples using direct payments to pay for care for the one from the other. 
And that's clearly the policy of it. We've covered married people by use of the word spouse, civil partners through the reference to civil partners. But then we've got to get on with cohabiting um, people. And this is specifically about people who live with the adult. Now, paragraph C is about all the other close relatives who are listed, but the rule only applies to them if they live in the same household. So what I want to do is to think back to this adult as if their spouse or civil partner rule could possibly mean. What do we think the as if bit means? You'd think of cohabiting, and maybe if you remember the 1970s, back to the bad old days where benefits officers would come round and use their Zoom lenses and see how many pairs of slippers would buy the double bed. The trouble is that not all couples sleep together. Not all couples have sex regularly or at all or wear slippers. And so I'm asking you to think, if you were the judge, what would you say was the essence of living with someone as if they were your spouse or partner. If one of you is disabled and has been cared for by the other, one can't really say that the mere fact of caring is the essence of the relationship that this rule is seeking to focus on, as far as I'm concerned. And the example I want you to think about is a real life one. This was a case that we had. A long since divorced couple The man went off with another woman, but that didn't last. And then he got cancer and his ex, they were formally divorced, let him come back to live in what had been the matrimonial home as a lodger. Really, she said, because of respect for how much he meant to their adult daughter. And the situation was that he paid no rent, but he did buy a new boiler He did pay for a shower to be fitted in the bedroom that he was given to sleep in, and he felt okay about his ex caring for him, he said, because she was at least familiar with his body, even though uh, they were divorced. They also admitted that they did things frequently with their grandchild together. They'd been on holiday together with their adult daughter and grandchild but they are definitely not intimate. Now, are they living together as if they were spouses or civil partners? Can you see that I'm getting at the judge's need to interpret what is the meaning of those words or what is the policy behind them? How many couples are intimate after reaching, for instance, the age of 70? The policy of this rule is to get free care out of people who might, if one is lucky, be expected to care for you. Being married or in a civil partnership is on one side of the line. Cohabiting, I think, is on the that side of the line. Being involved, even if not intimate, whereas house sharing between friends would definitely be on the other side of the line. Now, this case never went to court. But interestingly, when the couple who were concerned, I shouldn't call them a couple, when the man and the woman wanted to judicially review the refusal of the local authority to uh, let the woman be paid to look after the man, on the footing that they could not be paid because they lived in the same household as if spouses or civil partners, they went to the legal aid agency who does a financial assessment. And if you are living as man and wife, they assess both people's assets for the purposes of legal aid. And the biggest irony about that case, although it never went any further, was that the legal aid agency, who are not known for their generosity, actually regarded the man and the woman as not living together as man and wife for the purposes of the legal aid test. And so if the couple had intended to go further with this case, then they could have done. I ought to mention for everybody who's interested in this field that uh, this is a very technical part of direct payments. And the law here that I am referring to is only the starting presumption. 
it is possible for any local authority to waive this condition on the basis that it is necessary, that's the word, necessary for the forbidden person to in fact be paid. And that's a whole another area of public law exercising that discretion. But it does mean interpreting the meaning of the word necessary, does it not? I thought you might be like might be liking to see an, a really interesting direct payment case that very few people know about. You can see it's from 2011. And this case involved a man and a woman who were both um, uh, disabled. And the man had offences registered against him, serious sexual offences against a child. He had, and his partner had direct payments and they were big in the disability movement um, and, you know, were proponents of direct payments. So when the local authority found out, uh, sorry, when another local authority found out that this chap uh, was on the sex offenders uh, registration list, it got together with its home local authority and the home local authority had a very strong child protection policy. And its logic was that if this man had a female PA, it was very likely sooner or later that the female PA would bring her kids round to H's house because there would be a school pickup disaster. And so it was particularly a safeguarding concern that led the council to say to H, who had full mental capacity, we're going to put a condition on your direct payment to the effect that you have a managed account. We're not going to let you do the payments directly. We want you to put them through a manager, a third party managed account manager, and then we'll be able to find out all the time who your PAs are, and then we'll deal with it that way. We might, for instance, make you tell them. So it took three decisions. It made a disclosure of the sex offences to nine organisations with which H was involved. It told H and L that it reserved the right in future to contact other organisations. And it informed the personal assistance of its concerns and the underlying facts through the managed account system. So H and L... Um, you may think that they had some front, but this is the law in this country. They brought judicial review and Article 8 human rights proceedings to challenge these decisions. And they won. The Court of Appeal found that all of the disclosure decisions were unlawful. And the crucial factor there was that none of H's involvements brought him into any contact with children. So it was disproportionate. There was a blanket approach. There was procedural unfairness. And um, interestingly, and about error of law, the direct payment regime was being um, applied in such a way that was motivated by concerns outside of the direct payment uh, framework. So the barrister argued that the proposed managed account was unlawful. And the judge said that's a pure point of law and we are game to decide it. And they looked at the old regulations. Please note that these are not the current ones. And the rules were that if a person had capacity to consent to a direct payment, then the money would be paid either to them or to a person nominated by them to receive the payment. And in this case, the judge said, and I love the language here, there is no need for me to, to delve further into the statutory thicket. It is common ground that in relation to both H and L, the conditions are satisfied. They had full mental capacity and they'd been running a direct payment forever. The other regulations about incapacitated people do not apply and no one has been nominated uh, by them. And so on that basis, the judge said, the condition of imposing a managed account has to be considered as whether the condition is lawful. This condition, the judge said, went against the very essence of a direct payment. 
And I love this because just think how many local authorities run direct payments by reference to a payment card. Everybody's supposed to love them. But if you don't, I would say challenge it on the basis that it's not really a direct payment. The very essence of a direct payment, the judge said, is a payment, duh, which passes from the responsible authority to the payee. A condition that the payment should go through an intermediate account is inconsistent with the nature of a direct payment. And such a condition would be justified only if there was a specific statutory provision for allowing that. Now, the law has changed, so I'm not saying that managed accounts are unlawful. But the judge upheld the submission from the barrister that the local authority simply had no power at all to do what it was proposing to do. No power to channel the payments via a managed account. To accept the local authority's approach, the judge said, would impermissibly permit the attachment of a mere condition to destroy the very essence of the right to a direct payment. That would be neither principled nor consistent with the statutory scheme. So that was strong law, was it not? Now, I'll go quickly here because last week we looked at the Suffolk case. And this was a 2022 case that looked at the meaning of the word support in the CARE Act. Can the word support in the CARE Act as a matter of law be said to cover simply giving somebody some financial help so that they can buy an activity or so that they can afford to go on holiday. Effectively, that uh, judge in that case, Beverly Lang, looked at the question, looked at the policy, looked at the previous case law and agreed that, in fact, the word support was much wi wider than the old approach to uh, care, the care legislation being, un being there to underpin care and attention. Care and attention under the old law has a kind of connotation about it to do with being looked after, but care and support went wider. And um, the uh, Court of Appeal upheld Beverly Lang's first instance judgment. And that means that some disabled people get their fun paid for, whilst people without disabilities won't be able to get a financial subsidy. It doesn't matter if the Daily Mail goes absolutely ballistic about that, because it is the law. The law has now been interpreted. It doesn't mean that everybody gets a holiday. But it does mean that councils can't say we don't ever fund holidays or we don't ever fund activities. The most they can ever be is disability related expenditure. So that's another example of error of law in, a, in the very modern environment. What about the essence of care law in itself? The primary legal duty that has existed ever since care law began to meet a person's eligible unmet needs in the way set forth in the care plan. It might not feel like there's a right to have your care plan honoured, but that may well be because your care plan is just full of woolly outcomes like happy, safe client. That's very hard to pin down. But if your care plan has got a proper section on inputs as well as outcomes, then those inputs must be provided for by the local authority. And the case I wanted to show you that proves that is that in the Elaine McDonald incontinence pads case, which Elaine McDonald lost on the basis of dignity, dignity not being something that uh, was upheld in that case, the indignity rather of being made to uh, wet yourself on pads or Kylie sheeting when in fact you were not incontinent. Kensington and Chelsea, although they won, they didn't win the whole case. And our own House of Lords and also the European Court, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, discovered that there was a period in the run-up to the litigation 
when in fact, Miss McDonald's care plan said assistance to get to the commode at night. Now, to expect her to use incontinence pads when her care plan said assistance to get to the commode at night was unlawful in English law because of uh, a decade of cases that went back to the Gloucestershire case. When, in fact, they were able to review Miss MacDonald's needs and stopped expressing the needs in terms of services, but said that she needed toileting help, she needed to urinate safely, then it became magically lawful for them to meet that need by way of incontinence pads. And so that shows that however difficult social care law is, there is a basic principle that if your care plan is specific and you've got it in your care plan, it must be delivered regardless. And that is the law unless or until you are lawfully reassessed. And as I said, this has been the law since the 1997 Gloucestershire case. That case, for those of us who started to get interested in social care that long ago, it decided that the council's resources were not legally relevant to whether a person should be seen as eligible on the day of the assessment, but would be relevant, in other words, could lawfully be a factor as to where the line was drawn for on a reassessment when in the days that councils could set their own criteria. Councils are not allowed to mess with the criteria now. The only other relevance of running out of money, according to the Gloucestershire judges, was as to how to meet needs, not whether. And even then, when care planning, subject to public law principles, that the service had to be appropriate. And that piece of law on the meaning of what it means to meet needs has been translated into paragraph 1027 of the guidance. And I've highlighted there in the middle the essence of the Gloucestershire case. The local authority can reasonably consider how to balance the requirement not to run out of money locally with the duty to meet the eligible needs of any individual in determining how an individual's needs should be met, but not whether those needs are met. And so you can see that these principles have percolated through the ages. This is an interesting case, Harrison and Garnham, on why it took so very long to get personal health budget direct payments out of the NHS. Uh, Harrison and Garnham were two people on um, council direct payments. They both qualified for NHS continuing health care, and that therefore meant that they lost the benefit of the direct payments that they had been reliant on for their independence. So they challenged that, and they found a barrister to argue that the NHS legal framework was flexible enough to enable, without any amendment, the Secretary of State for Health to authorise actual cash equivalents for NHS continuing healthcare. And the um, Equalities and Human Rights Commission intervened, arguing that disabled people should have the right to control their care arrangements and that it shouldn't make a difference whether it was funded by the NHS or by councils. Now, this is the piece of law that was involved. Section 3 of the National Health Service Act 2006. The duty on the Secretary of State is in, in Section 3.1. The Secretary of State must provide throughout England to such extent as he considers necessary to meet all reasonable requirements. And then there's A, B, C and D. And then there's this. Such other services or facilities for the prevention of illness, the care of persons suffering from illness and the aftercare of persons who have suffered from illness as he considers are appropriate as part of the health service. So the barrister had to take that section and argue that the word services or the word facilities could cover cash payments 
instead of only the services themselves that the NHS gives you. So the barrister had a really energetic go and even found two extra bits in the NHS legislation about there being a duty to either provide or secure the provision of health care and the power to achieve that duty by doing anything incidental to that duty that the Secretary of State thought fit. And the barrister therefore really pushed the court to say that direct payments under the health service were, were, um, were within the power of the NHS. And the barrister's arguments were rejected on every single ground. Cash could not be taken to be a service. It could not be taken to a facility to be a facility. It was not covered by the rubric of securing the provision of a service, and it was not covered by the mop-up incidental power. And the reasoning had always been suspected. For at least 10 years, the National Framework for Continuing Healthcare had been saying that people had to consent to being assessed for continuing NHS healthcare even though that if you qualified for it, then it was illegal for the council to meet your needs. So if people wanted to keep their direct payments more than anything else, what they would do in light of this case law is to say, I don't even accept that I should be assessed. I don't want to be found to have qualified because it's going to mean that my life unravels. I'm going to lose my direct payments. So the judge said, I'm unable to agree with the submission that services can be provided. And the judge gave four separate reasons. And the judge said, and this is important, the reasons relate not merely to the historical context of the NHS legislation, but um, other principles as well. There are a number of drafting reasons. That means technical rules about the way the words had been used. And uh, the judge said, I'm not going to be persuaded that it makes any sense to interpret services as cash payments. The making of cash payments, the judge said, accompanied by whatever insistence that they be used only for the statutory purpose, contradicts this premise and in my judgment lies outside the statutory purpose. So it was through that that uh, the personal health budget regulations of 2013, I think it was, were ultimately passed to make it clear that the Secretary of State now could do that. An even older case uh, was heard in 2002 as to what it is that makes Section 117 Mental Health Act aftercare for people who've been detained in psychiatric hospitals, what is it that makes it free? In those days, judicial review was much more common and four local authorities took themselves to court. They found people, their clients, who were affected by the debate that was raging in those days. Half the country thought that 117 services were chargeable and the other half thought that they definitely weren't. So the sensible way the grown-ups who were leading the sector in that era thought to sort it out was by taking themselves off to the Judicial Review Court on a friendly basis so that a judge would explore the argument. And uh, it was basically argued this way. Either Section 117 is freestanding and it's nothing to do with continuing health care and it's nothing to do with care legislation or... It's actually just a gateway through to one set of provisions or the other. And then that theoretically means that if it's a gateway through to the social care that the person needs when they come out of hospital, then it's chargeable. So uh, the judges found um, very, very clearly that Section 117 was not a gateway. It said there was absolutely nothing to suggest that Section 117 services were chargeable or should be seen as a gateway. Section 117 was therefore said to be completely freestanding, and the judges looked a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right to find other reasons from the wording to prove to themselves that they were right. It says in Section 117 that it keeps referring to aftercare services provided under this section. 
And if it had just been a gateway through to the care legislation, it would have said, or under any other legislation to do with adult social care. So the judge said this, the use of language, this use of language is inconsistent with the services being provided under any other statutory provisions. No parliamentary draftsman charged with the task of producing a gateway provision could conceivably have produced the text without any wording to indicate a gateway provision was intended and with so many counterindications strewn over it. The parliamentary draftsman, in other words, would have had to have been sacked had that been the idea. And the judge said this, there was an argument advanced on behalf of the appellant authorities based on taking into account material from the parliamentary record, Hansard. The judge dismissed that. It was a hopeless attempt. The parliamentary material relied on throws absolutely no light whatsoever on the question of statutory construction before this house. So you can see that we needed the judicial review and we needed the court to um, make it clear that Section 117 services are free. And then um, the final example I want to use for you today of an error of law is a case that's only just got to the Supreme Court. It's the case about Worcestershire and Swindon to do with ordinary residents for Section 117 services when a person is already on a Section 117 and they are being looked after, after their first release from hospital, um, and they are um, living perfectly happily out of area on 117 services from their previous authority of ordinary residents. Then they are detained again. And the question is, does the old authority have to continue to provide Section 117 services when that person is again discharged from hospital? Or is it the new authority where they had gone to live? The judges have decided, finally, that the words in the statute, the words ordinarily resident before the uh, period of detention, should not be construed to incorporate deemed ordinary residents from another authority just because a previously liable organisation has made a contractual placement into a care home or a care package arrangement for the person out of area. And so that has put to rest a long-term, long-standing debate and the Secretary of State is busy amending the guidance at the moment to make the guidance match the case law. The judges have basically said, and I think that this is really telling if you look at the third bullet, when someone on a Section 117 has with capacity accepted being moved to a new area, or even if they have been moved incapacitatedly by a local authority or a relative, as long as it wasn't kidnap or something really dodgy, and then later on they have been resectioned, ordinary residents for Section 117 liable authority purposes, it arises afresh and it shifts at the point of discharge from the second detention to the new area. Um, the uh, local authorities in this case tried to persuade the judges to think about the implications of that. What were the pros and cons of that being the law? And the judges actually made very short shrift of that and said, well, it's fascinating to follow that through, but um, you're just talking, the judges said. You're not giving us any evidence that X, Y and Z would happen, like the argument was asserted, people will just be dumped out of area then. You're not giving us any evidence. You're just talking about the risk that that might happen. And so we're not going to take the possible consequences into account. We're judges and our job is simply pure statutory interpretation. So that is the material for today.
And that was a difficult set, difficult set of slides to get through. But it, it should be alerting you as listeners to things that your local authority is saying um, are its policies or ways in which they are interpreting the CARE Act. Um, does anybody have any questions uh, arising out of that? Would anybody like to put up their hand or unmute? Because I am game to be looking for hands. I will let you all unmute. Hang on one second. I have to let you all unmute now. There we go. Anyone can unmute now. Mina, would you like to kick off? If you can unmute, that would be good. Hi. Hi, uh, Belinda. My query is to do with the Mental Capacity Act. And okay. I have a lasting power of attorney for my son. And we carried out an independent assessment. I mean, but asked somebody, well, an organization to do it. And they found that my son didn't have mental capacity for his health and welfare. So does what does that mean? Does this mean that my attorneyship has kicked in that I am, what are my roles now? Because has he deteriorated, no, Mina? Has he actually deteriorated from when he gave you the power of attorney? He has. Okay. So on that footing, it is safe to say that your power of attorney for health and welfare is in theory alive and kicking. Okay. Because so, he has lost capacity. Yes. But it could be that he hasn't lost capacity globally. And mm. say, for instance, he decided that he wanted to drink alcohol or eat a lot of sugar. And you thought it was a very bad idea for him. But in fact, he still had capacity around those little things. Yes. Then your power of attorney would not cover those contentious things. So what does it actually mean for... Well, it's a very good question. Um, I always say to people when they come and tell me that they've got a lasting power of attorney for health and welfare, I say to them, mm, how did your loved one have that explained to them then? Because mm -hmm. if the parents don't know or aren't sure what it covers, the chances that the disabled adult will have got any of a better idea at the time when it was signed are hugely remote. In theory, if you had it done by a, a solicitor, they would yep. have had to have taken uh, your son to one side and explored with him what he thought he was granting, because that's the essence of a power of attorney. It's a person's understanding that even if they don't understand everything, they are picking up a set of decisions that would be theirs normally, and they are giving them to their parent. And so unless the solicitor did a good job, you probably have got a very, very vague set of rights. OK, it was done by a solicitor. Yep. And the, in, the assessment of my son's mental capacity was done by a professional organisation. Yep, that doesn't yeah. matter. I'm asking, okay. you, I, I, I can't say what okay. the solicitor told your son okay. it meant or whether your son understood that at the time but what does it mean now belinda how can i find out you can go back to the solicitor and you could say would you look up your file about the day we brought my son to you because okay. i'd like to know what the scope of the decisions was that you explained that he was effectively signing away for the future okay. when he had deteriorated. Okay. All right. So that's not really a question about error of law, though. Um, yeah. Does anybody have a question about that? Anybody else? Any interesting woolly words in the statute that somebody would like me to stick my neck out on? One, uh, one, uh, were one section that I will mention to you uh, just to go and look at. Section 69 of the CARE Act is about how long a local authority can pursue a charging debt for. Uh, 
and uh, there are some very interesting rules, generally speaking, that debts last for six years. Be and if proceedings haven't been issued within six years, then it's not possible to proceed upon them. Well, in Section 69, there is an, uh, an amendment of the law of limitation in that regard for Care Act debts. And there's one section that says um, when uh, it's a six-year period. And then there's another provision that says when it's a three-year period. So any errors of law around which of those subsections applies to a local authority would radically affect whether they could pursue charges against individuals where those charges had built up. Someone came to us this week and said that they owed £8,000 of charges from back in the day when their mother had been looking after their finances. But in fact, it wasn't clear whether their mother had just been trusted to do so or whether the individual had lacked capacity. And if the individual lacked capacity, then the local authority can't easily sue the individual anyway. That doesn't mean that they could sue the mother because the mother would only have been an attorney, a deputy or an appointee. But ultimately, that's the kind of um, error of law area um, of discussion that uh, experts will get into if you've got that kind of a legal problem. All right. So um, last chance, really, to stick your hand up. Otherwise, we're going to um, say goodbye. Next week is uh, session 11, and we're going to start on human rights and their relevance to adult social care. So I hope that will be interesting. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.